Hello! And I'm muting you all, so you're not able to say anything. Yes. Now, when you're now a teacher, that is what you really want. Can you hear now me? Now it's working. Yes. Yay! Good. <laughs> right, I feel incredibly silly standing in my living room. I'm just hoping I don't trip over the cat. Right, so, hi, my name is Ragnall Hutchison. I'm a historian. That always makes me feel like I'm in an Alcoholics Anonymous meeting, but being in a historian is sort of like being addicted to something. Um, so I'm going, to, I've been asked to, oops, whoa, sorry. Um, I have, I'm on VR glasses, which means I don't see anything around me. <laughs> and suddenly there's things blocking me. Well, we'll find it out. Um, I'm a historian. I also had a small company in the, uh, called Tidvis, which works on uh, new ways of disseminating history to um, a wide audience. And sometimes, quite often, we use digital tools and make computer games or digital worlds. We also make physical exhibitions or things that sort of interact and combine the physical and the digital. Um, and I've been asked to speak about, sorry, how games can bring archives to life. And I think I'm been asked to do that because that's what we've been doing. Uh, so a PhD in history from the European Union Institute in Florence. My personality is economic and, uh, economic and social development uh, in the early modern period, that's from between 1500 to about 1800. My really speciality, my sort of focus, my PhD and what I've been working about 15 years of my life on is Norwegian economic development, 1750 to 1830. I've also, and I'll give you a sneak peek on what that looks like. Ta-da, welcome to Norway. Approximately late 18th century. It's a period of, well, cold, winter and timber and fish. And we have the unfortunate thing that quite a lot of people don't really think to understand why this it's the coolest thing in the world. Now, I understand that because I've spent 15 years of my life on that. But I can understand why not everyone thinks so. Which is why we've started working on new ways of disseminating history. Now, I'm going to show you another thing that I've done together with very, very... Whoa, where's my hands? There. And that's another project that I've been working on as part of my research. And this is a huge database. It's actually not very big, but it's in database terms. But it's a big database detailing all the goods that have crossed into and out of Norwegian ports through the long 18th century, from about 1660 to about 1830. About 40 ports, and for most of that time period, at least a significant number of years, we have, I've led a project that transcribes these lists. These lists are so detailed that they actually, they detail how many toothbrushes arrived into Longesund, which was a port in 1756. How many pounds of sugar, how many, you know, yards of uh, cotton, how much coffee. These lists detail what you could actually buy in a Norwegian town and in the outskirts of Europe in the early modern period, the late 18th century. But most people don't know how to read this writing. I don't think you can see it, but this is a different alphabet as well. It's not the same alphabet as we use today. So we've transcribed this, put it into a searchable database, and we still have a problem getting people to understand this. Why is this so cool? I'm, you know, I think this is really, really cool, and it's very important material if you're going to understand what drives economic growth and, you know, understanding economic growth. So, this is 
why i got some friends with me and because we were sort of thinking we have to do something we have to up our dissemination game we have to think in new ways so let's see if we can sort of show people now historians are very sort of you know text-based people so what we did was we used 3d graphics and uh, computer programming unity in this sense to make a recreation of what Oslo looked like, the port, a part of Oslo. This is the port of Oslo. The port of Oslo in 1798. Um, and I'll give you a sneak peek. There. This is from our world. Um, let's see. I'm just sneaking on my notes here, sorry, which is a bit tricky. Um, this is one, this is, uh, well, here we're standing in the opera and we're going in. You can download this and you can see this properly on your own computer. Um, usually I show, show film. This is the fish market. Um, as you see, we have cardboard people. That's because we don't really have a budget in a whole sense, you know, whole scale of making a digital world. We have nothing. <laughs> Uh, this is a really, really cheap project. So we didn't have money to make 3D people. So what we instead did was to go into the, uh, into the art, the 18th century art, and cut out people and put them in. This is the same that, you know, um, uh, real estate agents do when they're about to sell a new house. You know, they show you this is what it's going to look like. And I put these strange cardboard people, we did the same. Um, but this is a fish market. And this is the, this is a wharfed. This is where the opera is today, if you're familiar with Oslo. Um, so what, whoa, I'm trying to hit some buttons with clickers, which is an interesting exercise. And I don't think you can, you have to be sober to do this. Sorry, uh, this was just a reflection. Um, we wanted to give, people a visual and interactive experience of what it could be like to walk through the streets of Oslo, uh, Christiania as it was known then, the streets of Oslo in the late 18th century. Because hopefully by doing that, they could understand, and become interested in the 18th century history of Norway and Oslo. Um, more specifically, um, well, we wanted to do that by focusing on three things. We had three guiding principles. One, we shall be true to the sources. Secondly, we will make the sources available and we want to reach as many people as possible. So that means I have to switch to the next slide. There. We shall be true to the sources. I'm going to tell you one thing. Historians are not nice people. Historians will eat you alive if you do not correctly refer and reflect the sources. And they are really, really, really mean if you're another historian. Which means that if we make any sorts of mistakes, is my head, as a head researcher, this is my PhD, PhD what we've re uh, recreated. It's not directly my PhD, but it's what I've been working on. This is my time period. It's my head in the gallows, and they are not nice. So that's sort of, that's the challenge when you're doing anything that has to do with history and archives and records. You, know, you have to make sure you're correct. True to the sources. If you don't know, then it's fine, but you have to say that. Which means that we have used a lot of archival sources to recreate this town. We've used the maps to get the properties in the right places. We even used plumbing maps from the late 18th century, which was quite cool. I learned they actually have plumbing. Ha! Um, I've learned a lot doing this. 
we have uh, made a whole new database uh, on uh, insurance papers, fire insurance papers that detail everything about houses. This is now online searchable and free for all to do. Um, we have um, used contemporary music. We have used the 18 1801 uh, census that details who lived in each of these houses. So we know, you know, we know it. In general, you can point at one house, I'll have to look it up, but I can tell you who lived in that house, how old they were, what their occupations were, and usually what they ate for breakfast on a Wednesday morning. This is what you expect if you have a historian heading a digital recreation project. Which means that, you know, the, the way the <laughs> you can fall quite far. But it does work. We also, I just wanted to show this because we're extremely nerdy. Um, and we found, found this really cool source, which is a weather diary. This was a guy who wrote, noted out in his almanac every day from 1766 to 1800, the weather in Oslo. It's quite cool. So we found this. We were tipped uh, by someone who knew about it. We found it. Transcribed the year 1792. This is the writing there. Put it into... <laughs> you know, something a computer can understand, put it into, the, into our digital world, and if you download it, you can now see the weather every day in 1792. And you can actually also go in and find your, you know, in, at least in Norwegian, we have a saying that if, um, if the weather's nice on your birthday, you've been a good boy or girl. So in this case, you can go in, find your birthday, and find out if you've been a good boy or girl in 1798. And it's given us sunrise, sunsets and sunrises like what you saw previously. It's quite cool. Um, it's also a very, very unique historical research, uh, source. Uh, this long time span, which we unfortunately didn't have time to transcribe, but it's most likely one of the best documented climate uh, sources or sources on climate possibly change. Um, yeah, let's see, can I change that? Oh, no, I'm probably running out of time, I'll be fast. We will, we will make the sources available. We, have you guys seen Breaking Bad? You're not able to speak, no. Well, in Breaking Bad, which is a TV series about drug uh, pushers, they have something called an entry drug. We tend to say that we are making the Port of Oslo We've made an entry drug. We want to show people, look how cool. And we do see they go in and say, wow, did it actually look like this? And we say, yes, we did. But how do you know? Ooh, well, you know, you can press these info points. You know, you can press these small buttons and we lead you on. And here you go down the rabbit hole. First, you come to the, you know, the easy, the, la the letters you can write, you can read, the text you can read, which you know, explain, explains who lived in this house, so and so, back and forth. And then we have, this is the hard drugs. And we have the links to the digital archive in Norway, which are scanned originals. So we lead you on into that. And the aim, the aim is to have people sitting in the reading room at the Royal Archives, you have to open your, increase your opening hours, by the way, sitting there flipping through the dusty protocols and journals, getting actual, you know, dust on their hands, because that is what I love. Um, so we make the sources available. Also, we want to reach as many as possible. And this is a key thing. One of the main challenges with making anything digital is that you can't see it. You can't stumble across it in the street. It's invisible. We, we recreated a part, a physical part of Oslo. In this area, there's only one house. How do I do that? There's only one house still remaining from this period. We want people to go down there and actually reflect and see. We were not allowed to put up any signs. Oslo has a very strong sign policy. Don't ask me. Um, so we had to think in new ways. We have a web page. 
as see, I'm trying to interact with my headset. We have a web page. On this, you can download the 3D computer game. Yeah, the computer game, you know, experience with the weather. Um, for some people, well, for many people, that's difficult because it's difficult to download things um, because of computer skills. We have an interlinked uh, 360 experience you access through your browser, on your computer, on your pad, or on your phone. Because what we want you to do is to print out this map that you see here. Or you can pick it up at a hotel when we have money to do that. And you take this to Björvika, which is the specific area. Read the QR codes, because people don't like apps. And Corona and COVID has trained us all like, you know, uh, to read these QR codes. So we know how to order beer with QR codes, at least in Norway. That's how you order beer now. So most people may think that it's a beer. Anyway, you read the QR codes, you find the places on the map in this physical space, read the QR code, and on your phone, you get the 360 image of what it looked like there 200 years ago. Um, we've made education packages, which are especially used now at this time of year, because that's when school center users uh, go through this part of curriculum. Um, yes, I'm speeding up. We have, um, we've made a cave here. This is because computer games are, you know, it's a single player thing. And we were planning on making this a multiple multiplayer VR experience. And then we started that on the 1st of March last year. Ha <laughs> ha. Then came 12th of March. Whee! Heads, headsets. You know, we could throw the headsets away. No way were we going to be able to make a multiplayer headset VR experience for museums. And I imagine the snotty three year old, five year old. You'd take the VR headset off the snotty five year old and give it to grandma over there. No, that's not going to work for another. Let's be realistic. So we have to think differently. We ended up with something far, far cooler. And that's the VR room where we project using three projectors and with a, with a PlayStation controller, you can walk in the, in the city of Oslo in 1798. It's really, really, really cool. I've had to carry people out there after one and a half hours. They just sit there. They get lost. I get lost. It's a huge world. It's really cool. And if you're in Oslo this summer, you can go to Kreftforeningens Viten Center. Cancer uh, Society's uh, um, exhibition center in the same area and experience this. And you can do it with your, you know, with, with your grandchild, with your child, depending on how old you are. And you have a social experience, which is also COVID safe. And um, I'm going to speed up. Oh! Uh, we have also made a game. Let's see. Yeah. Based on archival sources, this meet Edward, Edward Sills. He's a Norwegian African boy, lived in Oslo between 1790 and 1800. To tell his story, we've looked through archives in Oslo, Denmark, the West Indies, and his story is you, you experience this preferably in Oslo, but you can also find it, uh, play it online. Uh, while you walk in the town, and you play small mini games and you see what it looked like and you learn about the town and you learn about Edward's story. Um, this is a really, really cool guy. And if we ever get funding, Edward is going to be my, you know, big hero in a big computer game. He's really cool. Um, speeding on. So, regarding archival sources, Yes, they do give additional, significant additional value to your project. But you have to think and you have to be careful and you shouldn't sort of think that anyone can just jumble into an archive and think they know where to find stuff. Um, we've used stuff, archival sources, at the Norwegian Royal Archives, I don't think so, you know, they haven't been looked at for about a hundred years, some of those sources. 
you actually have to know them. You have to have the training to, to know what to look for and how to do it. But you know, you have historians. Um, what we do see is that the audience really appreciate it. We have in this project reached a group, uh, a target group that never really has felt that digital experience was something for them. They've seen shootouts, you know, car chases, stuff like that. This is women, 30 plus. And they come back and come back, especially older women, 60 plus. They keep returning to this. This works really well for school children, especially the cave experience. And if you give them the, the, the PlayStation controller, they run really fast and everyone above the age of 12 gets really, really seasick. It's terrible. Um, also, we see that we get um, that archival sources, if you know what to look for, they're really good for ideas, both for games like Edward, but also for details. Um, I'm very quickly show you uh, something we're working on. This, on the, this is on the Viking Age. So by the end of summer, we're going to have a full island in the Viking Age, about year thousand recreated with archaeologists. This is archaeological material, but archival material is this. This will be a 2D game that we're hoping to launch this autumn. And we're using the, the dress, the clothes patterns found in the archives of uh, the Institute of Buna, the Folk How on earth am I going to translate that? The, well, at the, at the, the national, uh, Norway has a national dress and they have, they have a in research institute that has a huge archive of clothes and clothes patterns. And we get to access this because we work closely with them. And we're making a game that sort of um, Kim Kardashian meets Bridgerton meets, we really like old textiles and clothes and fashions and have read too much Jane Austen. So we forgot that, you know, may, men exists and we made the game for us, which means me and Camilla at the Bunad and Folkdagsfjord. So this is probably not going to sell very well, but it's fully funded from, from other things. I'm going to now quickly finish, but this again is an example of how you can use archives into your games as a resource and as a treasure. And we want to link from this game to the actual clothes patterns so that people can actually sew them and make these clothes. And there are quite a lot of people who will actually do stuff like that. I think that's it. Sorry, I think I overstayed, sorry. Yeah. Thank you so much, thank you. Thank you, and now I am muted you all so you can, even you can try to clap in, real, in the real world. Maybe we can hear it. <laughs> Thank you so much. Well, there's lots of Wonderful hearts talk. here. That's really cool. <laughs> yeah, the hearts are, are cool. Thank you so much for sending love to Rahil. Amazing talk.